Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And in today's podcast, we have Dinosaur of the Day, Paralotitan, and we have a bunch of dinosaur news. But first, we'd like to give a big thank you to our Stegosaurus patrons, Kyle, Brendan, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, and Marcy. And we're currently at SVP. This is coming out on the first day of SVP, in fact. And we really want to thank all of our patrons for helping us get here. It's always a place where we learn a ton about what's going on with dinosaurs. And we'll hopefully get a few interviews done while we're here that'll come out over the next few weeks. Meet some cool people. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll report on a ton of new finds that get announced as well. And if you're not a patron and you would like your name read on our show, and you would like access to our ebooks or audiobooks or anything else, then head over to patreon.com and check out our rewards. Jumping right into the news, there's no new dinosaur this week. There's only been about 30 so what? far this year. Yeah. <laughs> Boo. But there are quite a few new tracks to talk about, which are almost as exciting, depending on if you're into ichnology. So the first one I want to talk about is two new types of dinosaur prints that were found by the A16 highway constructed in northwest Switzerland. And we talked about Jura Brontes earlier, which is a late Triassic theropod that had pretty big feet, almost as big as some of the largest theropod prints that have been found before. And they found another new likely theropod track type, or Ichnotaxa, as well as an unnamed ornithopod trackway. The named theropod trackway is Megalosaurus transgeranicus, and the Ichnogenus Megalosaurus was named back in the 50s, so it's not a new Ichnogenus, but it is a new Ichno species, which is that Transgeranicus. And that's an analogy to Highway A16, <laughs> which is called Transgeran in French, after the Jura Mountains, I believe. And they are from the late Jurassic. And in fact, Bonus fun fact, the fossils found in limestone in the Jura Mountains are the original source for the name the Jurassic Period. I was just going to say, Jura Jurassic. Yep. So Jura Brontes is actually kind of like Jurassic footprint, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's referencing the mountains, but then the mountains also are the source of Jurassic. So that's pretty cool. The largest Transjuranicus print that they found was about 80 centimeters or 2.6 feet long and that's in the same ballpark of Jura Brontes that they named recently although not quite as long and it's also different proportions that Jura Brontes track was about that wide as well whereas this Transgeranicus print is only about half as wide as it is long so it's a little bit longer of a foot if you look at it that way. They found multiple trackways of the ornithopod and the transgeranicus, and some of them are up to 40 steps long. So it's a pretty good set of footprints that they found out there. We're up to at least three different ichnotaxa and, you know, probably hundreds of tracks at this point. So that's pretty cool. Another bonus fun fact, it was actually a coastline during the Jurassic, which is how these prints got preserved, which is pretty crazy to think of the Swiss Alps as like coastline. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There are also two new sets of dinosaur footprints that were published in the journal Ichnos, I'm guessing after like Ichnotaxa and Ichnology. The first prints were found in the Prince Creek Formation, which is on the north slope of Alaska, and they were formed by, quote, trampling of an ash-covered swamp margin. What does that mean? <laughs> so I guess there was a swamp and it got some ash on it. And, and then, then it was trampled on? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and then it was filled with material by nearby rivers and that's what ultimately ended up preserving them. So we can see them now. Many of the spots were stepped in by multiple individuals. So identification isn't currently possible. I think that's what they mean by trampled. Lots of them stepping over and over again in the same spots. 
and they were likely hadrosaurs based on all the hadrosaur bones nearby. About 99% of the fossils in the area are juvenile hadrosaurs. <laughs> so yeah, I'd say it's a pretty good bet. And the largest footprint that was recovered was about 80 centimeters or 2.6 feet wide. And that might have been an adult hadrosaur. Like I said, there aren't really any adult hadrosaurs found in the area, but it seems like these footprints kind of show some adults in the mix as well. The other cool thing about these footprints is they're the highest latitude Maastrichtian footprints found to date. And as a reminder, the Maastrichtian is the last stage of the Cretaceous period. So if you're not the Maastrichtian, you're old news. <laughs> The last set of dinosaur tracks that I want to talk about are ankylosaur tracks, which we don't talk about all that often. These were found in the Huara Formation in Brazil, I think is how you say it. And they're also late Jurassic. They're the oldest evidence of an ankylosaur from Western Gondwana, which is basically the Americas, and the oldest evidence of any Thyreophoran from South America. So I guess there weren't any early stegosaurs found there yet, at least. They only found five prints across about 2.4 meters or 8 feet of length, but they do have one matching set of a footprint with a handprint, sort of. And I say handprint because it's like the forelimb, which is a lot smaller than the hind limb on ankylosaurs. Mm -hmm. And it looks really cool when they're paired up because you can actually see like four digits on it, so it almost looks like a person's hand. But they are quadrupeds, right? <laughs> yeah, but in Latin they call it the manus and the pes, mm. which basically means hand and foot. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of weird because their hands are shaped like feet. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a notosaur, meaning it didn't have a tail club, so that's... Uh, a little bit of a bummer, but it's not surprising. And I think the main reason they think that is because at that time it was basically all notosaurs. Next up, researchers from the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, Canada have found an ankylosaur skull. That means it does have a club, right? Well, it, it's a little vague because ankylosaurids have tail clubs. And when people talk about ankylosaurids, sometimes I say ankylosaur. But if you're talking about the larger group of ankylosaurs that include ankylosaurids and notosaurids, then, you know, some of them don't have tail clubs. So ankylosaur is a little bit ambiguous. Okay, never mind then. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one's called Euoplocephalus. That one is an ankylosaurid ankylosaur. So it had a tail club. Ah, good news then. <laughs> <laughs> and so they found it in southern Alberta and that type of dinosaur is unusual for that area. So Victoria Arbor said, quote, it's one of the nicest specimens of this particular type of dinosaur that we found down here. And Victoria and a team are in southern Alberta for a month-long dig called Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project. I think she mentioned it to us when we interviewed her a few weeks ago because she was going to do that before SVP. So it was going to be a lot going on for yeah. <laughs> in the summer. This find helps scientists know more about that region's ecosystem. And the skull's going to stay at the Royal Tyrrell Museum where it will be studied. They got a lot of good stuff there, especially ankylosaur stuff. Mm-hmm. Next up are a pair of papers by Peter Galton, both published in Nus Jarbuk für Geology und Paleontology, I think is how you say it. It's a German journal. And it's about two earlier finds of stegosaurs. The first one was about a stegosaur tail spine, and it was found in the Middle Jurassic in Dorset, England, which is really early for a stegosaur. And Galton points out that the most useful part of the fossil in terms of identification is a partial centrum, which is part of a vertebra, and it's missing characteristics that really help identify it specifically. So we can't really say that it is a stegosaur, just that it's some sort of thyreophoran and therefore might not be that early for a stegosaur. It's kind of hard to say. The other one that he looked at was a dermal plate, which is from the Maastrichtian in southern India, which is very late <laughs> for a stegosaur. It's kind of like the opposite end of the spectrum. And he points out that it's missing all the vascular exterior that's expected for a stegosaur plate. And you can tell that it washed down a river but even with washing down the river, it's still in reasonably good shape. So you wouldn't expect that exterior to get like blasted off. 
And since it's missing that, Galton believes that it's probably from a sauropod rather than from a stegosaur. Although either one's kind of hard to tell because it got washed down a river and they haven't found where the source was yet, so they haven't been able to find any other bones. So it makes me wonder, maybe he was working on like a history of stegosaurs or looking at the stegosaur family that he is looking at both ends of the extreme from totally different places. Thanks to Chris on Twitter for sharing this one with us. There was a discovery of a Chileosaurus, as in Chile, the place in South America. <laughs> and it was discovered back in 2015. I don't think we talked about it when it first was discovered. Yeah, we did talk about it because the big news then was that it was an herbivore, right? Or they thought it was an herbivore. And they also thought at the time it was a theropod. And then we had this idea for a funny dinner party story with Chileosaurus and a bunch of its theropod relatives, and then it'd be awkward because it's a vegetarian. <laughs> I didn't remember that, but it worked its way into our top 10 dinosaurs of 2015 too. Yep. That's good because it is pretty significant, getting more <laughs> significant all the time. So <laughs> the theropod was from the late Jurassic about 150 million years ago. And when I say about, it's pretty close to that. So that'll be kind of important later. Weirdly, it appears to be an herbivore, like Sabrina said, and it has spatula-shaped teeth, which obviously aren't very useful for cutting through meat. It's more like something you'd expect to see in an herbivore. And it has a theropod-like body, basically meaning that it has that long tail, kind of the body plan of a T-Rex sort of, or an Allosaurus, where the tail sticks out behind it and it's got two legs directly underneath it that make it look cursorial or good at running and all that kind of stuff that you'd want in being a carnivore. But it has Ornithischian-like hips, which is kind of confounding with that body plan. It's a really strange dinosaur. <laughs> That's so, why they call it a missing link. Yeah, that is one thing you could call it, maybe. Maybe erroneously, though. <laughs> so there's a new article that reevaluates its position as a basal tetanurin, which is what they originally called it. And tetanurins, I think, mean stiff tail or something like that. And it's that body type I was talking about where you have that long tail behind you and it can be useful if you're running quickly. The article is titled A Dinosaur Missing Link, Chilesaurus, and the Early Evolution of Ornithischian Dinosaurs by Matthew Barron and Paul Barrett. And if you recognize one of those names, it might be because Matthew Barron was the lead author on the Ornithocelida paper, and Paul Barrett was another author from that paper. Oh, the one that recategorizes dinosaurs as a whole? Yes. So rather than being in Saurischia and Ornithischia, they propose making it sauropodomorphs or something. That, that side's a little bit unclear. And then also Ornithocelida, which includes both theropods and Ornithischians, which is kind of controversial, obviously, because <laughs> it overturns like 100 years of science. So Baron, the guy who made Ornithocelida, plugged Chilesaurus into his large dinosaur data set rather than into a subset like the original authors did to see where it would fit in the entire tree of dinosaurs. And since the software that he's using with his characters is going to break them down into Ornithocelida, you know that it's going to be in one of the two new categories. And where it ended up putting it was as the, quote, earliest diverging member of Ornithischia. In other words, that reaffirms Barron's previous assertion that Ornithischia and Theropoda both belong to Ornithocelida, and then it put this guy that's kind of in between the two in terms of characteristics, just inside of Ornithischia, as opposed to Theropoda, which is where it was before. But the missing link moniker is a little bit misleading because Chilesaurus represents a very early Ornithischian, but it's after Ornithischia split off from Ornithocelida. It's not like really in between the two. It doesn't really show a transition. And if they're proposing that Ornithocelida split into both Theropoda and Ornithischia, then it might be tens of millions of years after the actual split on the branch, and that this individual just happens to maintain some of those features that are in both groups. 
And actually, it would have to be the case that that's happening because there are stegosaurs that were around 5 to 15 million years before Chilaeosaurus. So if it's truly a missing link, <laughs> it would have to exist before any other Ornithischian, right? Mm. And it doesn't. So it's not really a missing link. It's just something that shows evidence towards there being some missing link that we'll almost certainly never find. And it's also just a strange dinosaur. Yes. <laughs> This isn't really that surprising because we talk about basal sauropods all the time, and basal sauropods really just mean that they have traits in common with early sauropods when they were evolving from other sauropodomorphs. And it really points out the problem with calling things basal or transitional because we're talking about features that they have more than the actual age and where they fit within the actual evolutionary path. So it can be pretty misleading. And then when you take it to the point of saying it's a missing link, you really get the idea, oh, Chileosaurus was this dinosaur that all of Ornithischia evolved from, which is almost certainly untrue, especially in this case, because we know of Ornithischians that are older than Chileosaurus. <laughs> so anyway, it is still really cool. It has characteristics of both groups and it shows how the groups are related. And most importantly, it adds evidence to Ornithocelida being a more parsimonious explanation of which groups dinosaurs should be split into. Well, that's good for these authors then. Yeah, I think that's why they published both. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really interested to see what people talk about at SVP because this the Ornithocelida paper came out kind of halfway in between last year and this year's SVP. So I'm sure there'll be a lot of talk about it and I want to see what everybody thinks about it. It's going to be the talk of the town. I think. Unless there's something bigger that there we're not be. aware of yet. Oh, think of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the beauty of SVP. It is. So next, some sad news. Haruo Nakajima, the Japanese actor who played the original Godzilla, has passed away at the age of 88. And he was Godzilla in the 1954 movie and 11 other films. His suit apparently weighed 220 pounds or 100 kilograms. Holy cow, that is crazy heavy. Yeah, so what happened is it's hard to get rubber after World War II, so they used ready-mixed concrete. <laughs> oh no, that is not the ideal thing to wear. <laughs> no, so it was heavy and hot, especially under all the lights. Oh man. So the poor guy. Uh, in an interview earlier this year with The Great Big Story, he said that he got the part for Godzilla on the set of a World War II film where an airplane was on fire and an actor had to jump out of it. And... He was the actor, I believe, who jumped out of it. So hmm. the director of Godzilla, Ishiro Honda, thought that he had a lot of energy based on this. <laughs> and Nakajima said that he studied big animals at a zoo to help him prepare for the Godzilla role by watching elephants and bears. Did he think he had a lot of energy and that was important because he had to hold up 100 kilograms of suit? I don't think they knew <laughs> what the suit was going to weigh at the time. I hope that some of that was like supported behind it because it kind of had that tail that was near the ground. I hope there was like a wheel on that or something I so can't that he imagine. wasn't holding it up the whole time. Can't imagine. Yeah, that sucks. But we should watch that original Godzilla. Yeah. Really appreciate the work he does. It's definitely a dinosaur-ish movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Next up, thanks to Kevin for sharing this BBC story with us. It includes two of my favorite things, which are both dinosaurs and bats. How much better can you get? I don't, I can't think of anything better. Well, it's not like a living dinosaur, sadly. It's actually a sculpture at the Wildlife Dinosaur Park in Combe Martin, UK, which is a really large park. I looked at it on a map. It's like several square miles on the coast in Devon, which is across the Bristol Channel from Wales, so kind of on that southwest part of Britain. And there's a group of lesser horseshoe bats that That's have moved... awful name for bats. They're lesser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if it refers to a region or that they're like smaller or something. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But they moved into a Triceratops sculpture, which is pretty cool. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how they got in and out of the sculpture, though. It looks like the mouth is open. At least it's posed open. I don't know if there's actually a hole in it or not. Or maybe there's a hole in the, kind of the belly, since that's where they apparently live. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of a low point, if you imagine a triceratops gut hanging down. Mm -hmm. So they might have drilled a hole there. I don't know. I don't know where they're flying in and out of, but that'd be kind of fun to see. <laughs> 
They think there's about eight bats living in there, and the bats are endangered, which means that that Triceratops sculpture is basically like an official home of the bats <laughs> now. They can't be like forced out or anything like that. Oh, good. But oh no, there's lesser bats. <laughs> but um. <laughs> Never appreciate my jokes. How long were you working on that? Well, I didn't want to interrupt. I see. But I wasn't working on it that long. All bats are greater, in my opinion. They're all wonderful. Oh, okay. Especially the really big ones. The bigger, the better. The bigger, the greater. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. I appreciate that joke. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next, a doctor in Texas who purchased a Tarbosaurus batar skull... For some reason, the news report said Tyrannosaurus again, but we know it was Tarbosaurus because he's fighting now to keep it. It was seized in 2013, but it's from Mongolia. It was illegally smuggled out and so has to go back to Mongolia. Yeah, I think they might have been sort of right for the wrong reasons <laughs> mm. because some people do lump together Tarbosaurus and Tyrannosaurus. But that doesn't seem to very, be very common. I think most people just know that it's a tyrannosaur, mm. not knowing that tyrannosaurs are like a larger family. Sure. Well, they did give the species name, so maybe you're right. Yeah. But the reason it's news is because the U.S. attorney filed a forfeiture lawsuit this month, which it's unclear why it was filed four years after the seizure. Probably because the owner didn't give it up, would be my guess. No, he gave, it was seized in 2013. And then, you know, we've talked about these things before. Nicolas Cage had to return his skull mm -hmm. a while back, too. So the doctor, James Goodwin, he's contesting the forfeiture, saying that he bought the skull legally in the U.S. And the case is going to dig into dinosaur fossil smuggling networks. And according to Dallas News, who reported the story, quote, is likely to reignite simmering tensions between fossil dealers and paleontologists, end quote. Interesting. Yeah, it is really annoying to me just how little culpability there is between people that sell these fossils. Like, there's no reason that an auction house doesn't just sell tons of stolen fossils or stolen art, because apparently they're not liable for it. It seems like if something they sell at auction gets seized, they aren't really responsible for it, and they don't have to pay back any money or anything. So it, it kind of encourages them to look the other way and not look into it, and then I think this guy bought it from a friend or something, mm -hmm. so it's gone down the chain a little ways, and at that point, you don't know that it was ever illegally smuggled. Well, and he has no way of getting his money back either. Yeah, I think he would have to like sue his friend, basically, for selling him something stolen, and there you might have to prove that the person knew it was stolen when they sold it to you. So, yeah, it's kind of a mess. In other messes... <laughs> In Concord, New Hampshire, police are looking for a man who stole what's called the donation dinosaur from a children's hospital. And there's footage of the man taking the dinosaur. Police apparently found the damaged donation dinosaur nearby with most of the money missing. So that's too bad. There weren't many details about what this donation dinosaur looked like. Stealing from sick children? Mm. Come on. Not great. No. And damaging a dinosaur in the at the same time? Mm-hmm kind of a monster <laughs> <laughs> but so that we end on a happy note the museum of northern arizona and flagstaff is having an event on august 31st called highland center for trips and tours dinosaurs in arizona and dr dave gillette the curator of vertebrate paleontology will lead the tour it costs 65 dollars for adults and will include a tour of the dinosaur exhibit at the museum and a boxed lunch and i think it will give you a bus ride to the museum as well nice mm-hmm and before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we want to quickly thank all of our Patreon supporters again for helping us get to SVP, where we are now, hopefully, when this airs, <laughs> assuming nothing went horribly wrong on our Don't trip. Don't jinx us. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, break a leg. You have to... Mm, I don't know. Isn't jinxing like, I'm sure everything goes perfectly fine? I don't know. It's all bad. Okay. Forget that part then. We're in Calgary, we're enjoying dinosaurs, end of story. <laughs> and as a reminder, we have quite a few reward tiers up on our Patreon website. With new ones coming soon. At least one more, yeah. We've got a $5 Stegosaurus level, where you'll get your name read during our show, like you hear at the beginning of every show. 
And then at the $10 level, which is the Triceratops level and above, you'll get a ad-free version of our show if you don't like listening to ads such as this. <laughs> and then at the $20 level, you also get copies of all of the ebooks that Sabrina has made over the years. And at the $50 level, you also get access to our audiobooks. And in both of those rewards tiers, the Tyrannosaurus and the Spinosaurus, you get access to the books a month earlier than anybody else does. So if you really want to get the top 10 dinosaurs of 2017 as early as possible, then you should sign up for the Tyrannosaurus or Spinosaurus tier. So if you want to join any of our reward tiers, head over to patreon.com slash I know dino and you can see what we have to offer there. We also have a super old intro video that we really need to update <laughs> as soon as we clean up our recording space a little bit so it's not so embarrassing with all the debris everywhere. I wouldn't call it debris. Work tools. Sabrina has a system, apparently. It's like a mountain. It's like paleontology. You know how old it is, so you just dig that deep in the pile and you fish out what you need. I don't think it's that old. <laughs> anyway, eventually we'll share our new and improved workstation with the microphones and everything that all of our supporters helped us buy. And now on to the dinosaur of the day, Parella Titan, which was a request from Dinosaur4602 via YouTube. So thanks. It was a titanosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Egypt in the Baharia Formation. And the name means tidal giant. The type species is Paralatitan stromeri, and the full name means Stromer's Tidal Giant. The name honors Ernst Stromer von Reckenbach, the German paleontologist who found dinosaurs in the Baharia Oasis in Egypt in the early 1900s. And it was named by Joshua Smith, Matthew Lamana, Kenneth Lakovara, Peter Dodson, Jennifer Smith, Jason Poole, Robert Gigengak, and Yusri Atia in 2001. Parla Titan was the first tetrapod reported from the area since 1935. Researchers found only partial postcranial remains, not the skull, and this included vertebrae, a pectoral girdle, and forelimb elements. The specimen that they found was probably scavenged. Parla Titan may have been prey for Bahariosaurus, Carcharodontosaurus, and possibly Spinosaurus, but only if they hunted in groups. Also, Spinosaurus may not have been able to hunt on land. The paralatitan skeleton found was preserved in tidal flat deposits with fossilized mangroves. It was a tidal ecosystem and tropical. Paralatitan is one of the largest dinosaurs. It's up there with Dreadnoughtus, Tyriosaurus, Argentinosaurus, so that's why if it was prey, it would have had to be taken down by a group. And now Patagotitan. Yes. <laughs> Good call. One science journalist said in 2001 that Paralatitan, quote, appears to have been the second largest known creature to ever walk on Earth, end quote. But remember, that was back in 2001, and we've since found... Patagotitan? Yes. <laughs> and it's really hard to rank them, as, as we've said before, so mm -hmm. kind of hard to say. But it has a five and a half foot or 1.7 meter long humerus. Not much is known about Paralatitan, but it's thought to have weighed about 59 tons or 65 short tons and maybe was 85 feet or 26 meters long. It may have had osteoderms used for defense. So the land where Paralatitan lived was sometimes underwater for long periods of time when global sea levels rose and then reappeared when sea levels dropped again. And Paralatitan helps show that Africa and South America may have been part of the same landmass in the late Cretaceous. Groups of animals have been found common to both South America and Madagascar from the time, but not so much from Africa, possibly because there's not been much research done over there. Paralatitan also lived around the same time and place as Egyptosaurus, which was another sauropod. And our fun fact of the day is that we're actually pretty confident in our estimates of dinosaur eyes, despite no eyes ever fossilizing. And that's because there are sclerotic rings oh, yeah. in dinosaur eyeballs that fossilize. Sclerotic rings are a series of bones that make a ring around the iris in the front of the eye, and they're in lots of vertebrates, but not in mammals or crocodiles. Interestingly, especially considering how close people think of crocodiles being to dinosaurs. I'm glad we don't have sclerotic rings in our eyes. Eh, I'm neutral on it. I'm mm. not really sure how useful they are. They are in pterosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and dinosaurs, as well as, I think, all modern birds. 
being dinosaurs, that would make sense. You can often see them mounted with dinosaur fossils where the eye would be. There's often like a little post with a little ring of bones. And at first when I saw those as a kid, I thought, oh, they're just simulating where the eye would be. But oh, that's actually bones. But, you know, they would be floating in eye tissue. <laughs> they wouldn't just be hanging out in an empty eye socket. Would uh, hope not. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't always preserve since they're very small and fragile. They're kind of like the aperture of a camera, if you're familiar with that. A bunch of little blades that interlock and can articulate smaller and larger. So when the animal dies, they're no longer connected by anything. So you're left with all these just individual little pieces of bone that don't even look round. So if you just saw an individual one, you wouldn't realize it as part of a sclerotic ring unless you really know what you're looking for. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. And if you want to join our growing group of amazing dinosaur enthusiasts, check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.